Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary and his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. Because your word brings us life, it gives us hope and peace and joy. And this morning, as Pastor Doug brings your word to us, Father, and brings it to life, may it bring life and hope and healing to our hearts. We pray that your heavenly angels that excel in strength will fill this sanctuary, and your Holy Spirit will minister to each of our hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Has anyone been shopping lately? Show of hands, help me. How many of you have been shopping lately? How many of you men have not been to a mall in the last 30 days? Let me see. Now, ladies, how many of you have not been to a mall in the last 30 days? Ah, it's not near as, not near as many. Do you enjoy shopping? Nobody enjoys it. How many will admit that they enjoy shopping? How many admit shop, you enjoy shopping for yourself? Is it difficult shopping for others? You know why sometimes it's compounded? Because you want to get the right gift and you don't know how or can't afford to get the right gift, don't know what the right gift is. We want to get the gifts that will demonstrate and reflect our love and appreciation for people. And uh, sometimes it takes a little thinking. Um, I have a working arrangement with my wife where I buy one or two gifts and she takes care of the rest. It's amazing how that works. And I'm happy with that arrangement. When I, uh, not this year, but in other years when I'm looking for something for care and I'll go to the mall. I have no idea what I'm looking for typically. Sometimes I'll call her mother because Bonnie and Karen have this telepathy where they just know what the other one wants. And I'll go to the mall and I just walk up the mall and I hope that something, some spirit will lead me to know what I'm supposed to do, where I'm supposed to go. Really, any of you men have that? Come on. There you go. And it's, how many of you do this the day before Christmas? That's right. Okay, I'm not alone. Giving the greatest gift. Giving the greatest gift. Well, of course, this time of year, you know what the conclusion of this sermon is before we begin. The greatest gift came from the greatest giver. God so loved the world, He gave. But I want to look at a couple of uh, stories in the Bible, beginning with the one in our scripture reading, of some wise men who gave great gifts that had great significance to a great king. I'm going to take you from chapter 2 of Matthew through what we've just read to get the whole picture here. Chapter 2, verse 1 in the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, this would be Herod the Great, the first of the Herods, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Now, these wise men, the word is magios there, and it's probably true that they were wise. Uh, We sometimes call them kings. They're not really called kings anywhere. Uh, They were probably patriarchal clan leaders. This word is often attributed to those from the tribes of Midian, or you know, the Medes rather, the Medes and the Persians. Ultimately, the Persians sort of eclipsed the Median power and the Medes sort of reverted back to the desert 
and they were considered nomadic leaders. They were sort of the priests of the people of Persia, something like the Levites were of Israel. Now evidently, they saw this luminescent phenomenon, this star in the heavens that was there for some time, about the time of Christ's birth, and they began to search the prophetic roles and the writings of the sages to find out what this means. And you might be wondering, how did they ever find out that this star in the sky was some way a symbol of Jesus' birth? You remember in the book of Numbers, especially in chapters 24 verse 17, Balaam the prophet was engaged by Balak to curse Israel. And as he stood on the bluff and he overlooked the people of Israel, he would try to pronounce this curse, but instead a blessing came out of his mouth. On several occasions he tried to curse, but instead he blessed. One of those prophetic oracles found in Numbers 24 verse 17, Balaam said, A star shall come out of Jacob. And this star, this was coming out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. A scepter is something associated with a king. That was a prophecy that was still maintained in the libraries of the East. Also please keep in mind that Daniel, the prophet, he had his headquarters in Mesopotamia, in Babylon. He was the chief of the wise men. You remember after Daniel interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the metallic image, he was promoted to be the chief of the wise men. And no doubt those wise men in the east became familiar with the oracles and prophecies of the people of Israel. So when these Magi saw this star in the heaven, they read that passage in Numbers 24:17, A star will come out of Jacob, that was a name for Israel, and a scepter. This must be a sign of that approaching king. You can also read in the writings of Josephus, and a number of the other contemporaries that there was almost universal acceptance Virgil the prophet or the poet there was almost a universal acceptance of an expectation of a coming redeemer about the time that Christ came it could be that God was speaking through other godly people and prophets in many parts of the world at the same time letting them know that something significant was about to happen sad thing is that when he came to his own people the majority of his own people and the religious leaders were oblivious that's why it says that when they came into Jerusalem they said where is he that is born king of the Jews they expected the city to be in a, an uproar of festivity celebrating this newborn king and they all seemed baffled by what these wise men were talking about the Bible tells us that all Jerusalem was troubled what? coming king? Not yet? No, it's not happening like this. The priests haven't told us about it. The government hasn't told us about it. What are you talking about? And it uh, created quite a stir. You know, I believe that history has a tendency to repeat itself, especially biblical history. Please don't miss this important point, that God's own people that had His Word, that should have known, that were privileged to understand the time of Christ's first coming, were spiritually snoring in a deep sleep when it happened. Could it be that history could repeat itself? Could it be a body of people that even bear the name Adventist could be snoring at the omens of the second coming? Could it be that those of us who know sleep when that time comes? Could it be the stones will cry out and God will reveal that truth about the eminence of His coming to other people who maybe are looking and searching and hungry? Now we don't know how long it took, but you remember after Herod interviewed them, trying to find out when the star first appeared, it seems like it was more than a year, less than two years, because Herod, you know, was so threatened and jealous that this newborn king would take his throne. I don't know what he was worried about. He was an old man and this was a baby. He still had plenty of time left, but he was so jealous for his position that he had all the babies two years old and under executed in Bethlehem and even 2,000 years later it makes us shudder to think about the wail that must have gone up from that little hamlet after the Roman soldiers left. But when you consider that they told the king, the wise men not knowing what the king was going to do with this information, that it was 
more than a year ago when the star had first appeared. That tells us that they probably saw the star, which was a band of angels, and they began to search, and it may have been months before they figured out what it meant, and then they decided to take a trip, and they got their gifts together, and they crossed the desert, which took months. They invested a great deal of time in making this journey. They expected there to be a long line. They expected to get in on the tail of the line, but they wanted to bring something, and when nobody was there, they were amazed. After they left their audience with Herod, the Bible tells us that the star appeared again. You know, when they came to Jerusalem, the star must have been obscured by the clouds or the angels must have grown dim. You'd think that it would have been shining the brightest right over the temple. But the leaders of the temple had no idea. Could it be it would happen that way again? God does great things and He often reveals it to those of simple origins. Shepherds, foreigners, Let's not become smug and think that our possession of a Bible, our knowledge of biblical chronology is going to be a substitute for sincerity of heart and a desire to worship. The shepherds were looking for his coming. The wise men were wanting to give of their means. And uh, we want to be prepared when that time comes. And then it says, when the star reappeared after they left Herod, I'd like to read that to you again. Then they were thrilled with exceeding great joy. Turn, I, I want to get it right from the Bible here. I'm trying to wing it from memory. Look at this here. In uh, Matthew chapter 2. And I want to go with verse um, 10. When they saw the star, it reappeared after they left Herod. They rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Can you imagine making that journey across the desert for months, all those miles, you've come prepared to give this gift and not be able to give it? Because you're beginning to wonder, maybe the prophecies were wrong, maybe we misinterpreted the prophecies, maybe we're too late, and they're thinking the whole journey has been in vain. Nobody in town seems to know anything about this. And just as they're about to give up hope, they're bewildered, they're discouraged, the star reappears. And can you understand why they saw that with exceeding great joy? They rejoiced. Now I want to ask you, when Jesus came the first time, the angels said to sing with great joy, rejoice, peace on earth. Did he save the world from their sins when he was born as a baby? No. Why was it a time of such great rejoicing? Picture, if you will, people who have been on a ship that sinks. They're floating around in a dark ocean for days. They don't know if anyone knows where they are. They don't know if there's any hope approaching. They see a plane fly over and they get excited but it keeps on going. They wave their clothes and they don't seem to see. Then they see off in the distance, early one morning, the beacon of a light on the water. And as the waves bring their little life ve vessel up on the top, they can see it in the distance. And they wave and they're wondering, is there any hope? They're dying. Even though the ship is miles away, it signals, it flashes to them. They rejoice when they know that help is on the way. The ship is not there yet. This world was like miners trapped in a mine for days not knowing if they were going to be rescued before their oxygen is exhausted and then after days of waiting for help to come and they're in the dark and they're out of water and they're out of light they hear tap 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 on the wall they're not rescued yet but their hope is revived they can rejoice with exceeding great joy because it means help is coming when Jesus came as a baby I mean what's the baby going to do to save the world what it meant was is that God has sent help so you can understand why they were rejoicing. Their mission was a success. And they came into the house. Of course, it was not the stable at this point. Joseph and Mary had set up home, probably with uh, some relatives in uh, Bethlehem now. And they came into the house and they saw the young child, doesn't say infant, it's a different word, with Mary his mother, and they fell down and they worshipped him. Can you see these three patriarchal clan leaders on their knees before a toddler? I mean, he may have been 18 months old and walking. And there they are, and they unload their camels. They may have had servants attending them. 
And the servants bring in these three very important symbolic gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now I'd like to take a little better look at what these great gifts were that were brought by the Magi. Gold, of course, through history, has been symbolic as a symbol of the most precious of metals, and it still is today. It's a universal symbol of material value and wealth. It was used extensively in the construction of the temple. Never forget that the gold of the temple was predominantly on the inside, not on the outside. Gold was a symbol of love and faith and real Christian merit and worth. That's why Jesus says in Revelation 3.18, I counsel you to buy from me gold. What is the Lord saying? Buy gold from Jesus? What do you think that gold is? What is it that Christ gives us? His character, His Word, and that's another symbol for the gold. Psalm 119, verse, verse 127, speaking of the law of God and His Word, Therefore I love your commandments more than gold, more than fine or purified gold. Psalm 19, verse 10, speaking of the Word of God again, More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. So this gold that the wise men gave was a symbol of the Word of God the love of God. Furthermore, they gave frankincense. Now, if you ever want to know what frankincense is, just take the last half of the word, and it's incense. Frankincense was one of the most precious and rare forms of incense. It was used as a symbol of the prayers ascending to a deity. In the temple, they were to mix frankincense with their offering that went on the altar and it ascended before the veil as a symbol of the prayers that went before God. This is a symbol of Jesus as the priest. Psalm, Song of Solomon, verse 4, or I'm sorry, verse 6, chapter 4. It says, Until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. This is a song of love. You've read Song of Solomon before. It's the love story between Christ and His church. Have you ever known that? That's really what the symbol of this is all about. And here, they're bringing this. Do you know that it, it had been foretold that these Gentile kings would bring these gifts? In Psalm 72, verse 10 and 11, the kings of Tarshish and the isles will bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba will offer gifts. Yes, all the kings will fall down before him. All nations will serve him. It was even prophesied in the Old Testament that these Gentile kings would bring their gifts before the Messiah. Isaiah 60, verse 3 and 5. The Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. Isaiah 60, verse 6. The multitude of camels shall cover your land. The dromedaries of Midian. Where did I say the Magi were from? They were priests of Midian and also from the Medes. All those from Sheba shall come. They will bring gold and incense. They will proclaim the praises of the Lord. Isn't it interesting here? They were rejoicing. They were calling him king. They're bringing the gold. They're bringing the gifts. And the Bible tells us that some of the most generous people to the Lord were the Gentiles. Well, I talked about the gold. I talked about the frankincense. Frankincense is, is formed by scarring these trees that grow in the desert. They would collect the sap and dry it, and they'd make this powder that they would then uh, spread. And it's a rough-looking acacia tree. You can see a picture there on the screen of what it looked like after they processed it. Many of the roads in the Middle East today it's called the frankincense trail because frankincense was worth more than gold back then it was very precious and the camels and the dromedaries the caravan trails were often formed by salt and frankincense and so many of the ancient roads that you find the trade routes that you find in the Middle East were called the frankincense trail what was the name of the third gift myrrh you know, when you think about the second church in Revelation, chapter 2, it's the church of Smyrna. Myrrh was another very precious substance that was used in making ointments for anointing kings and embalming the dead. Now, it, myrrh is, for me, one of the most interesting of the three gifts that were all symbols for Christ. Myrrh is a sap from the trunk of the larger branches of this thorny acacia-like tree growing in Arabia and Egypt. 
the skin or the bark of the plant is pierced. It's pierced so that the plant will bleed. A white, pure white gum comes out that turns red on contact with the air, something like an apple core does. The myrrh hardens into teardrop. You listening to the language here? The myrrh hardens into teardrop shapes that then dry. The chunks are then collected, made into ointments and perfumes. Its strong, agreeable smell has been entered into the composition of the most costly ointments among the ancients. Myrrh, very much a symbol of Christ's sufferings and his kingship. You know, the Bible tells us in Mark chapter 15, myrrh also had medicinal properties. It was supposed to help deal with pain when Christ was on the cross. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink. When he tasted it, he, he then refused. He did not want to have his mind clouded. John 19, verse 39. And Nicodemus, who came first to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes of about a hundred pounds for anointing him. So, the Magi offered him incense as their god, gold as their king, and myrrh as their sacrifice. You know, just it's for free. I was studying myrrh this week and somebody actually took a m picture of myrrh under a high-powered microscope, microscope and this is what the crystals look like. Isn't that beautiful? I thought to myself, somebody ought to use that pattern of the crystals of myrrh for Christmas wrapping paper. Wouldn't that be appropriate? I thought that was so pretty. I don't know how to fit it in with the message. I just wanted you to look at that. <laughs> Microscopic myrrh. Well, what is a gift? Definition. Something that is bestowed voluntarily and without compensation. Don't forget that. A real gift is without compensation. How many of you feel at Christmas time somebody gives you a gift? Oop, I've got to reciprocate, right? You know, Jesus says, give expecting nothing in return. I think that's a good attitude for all of us. Um, Karen and I have trouble trying to keep up with giving the Christmas cards to people that send you cards. I don't know how you are, but we always like to reciprocate. And someone gives us a gift, we give them a gift. And we say, they didn't give us a gift last year, we're not giving them one this year, right? <laughs> and, and so, but that's not a real gift, is it? A gift is that you give expecting nothing in return. Or you send a card just to show your appreciation. You know, we're getting fewer cards, we're getting more letters. People are turning, and now we're getting Christmas email. I mean, it's really cheap. <laughs> People are emailing us their Christmas letters. And I don't know how they get our names, but we're getting them from all over the world. But uh, gifts can be good, gifts can be bad. Gifts can bring out the best, they can bring out the worst. This week, in preparation for this message, I thought it would be worth mentioning to you, you know that three people were killed in Brazil? How many of you heard about that? Brazil decided to offer free gifts to some of the poor. And hours before the doors opened at this department store, people lined up and they just jammed the door so much to get these free gifts that a woman and three children were trampled to death because they wanted gifts. Everybody likes getting a gift. Most of us do. Now, gifts can be good, good and they can be bad. You notice we read about the Gentiles would bring gifts to the king. That also smacks of a gift that was brought by the Queen of Sheba. One of the things a gift will do is it opens the door. You know, my mother tried to teach me that when you go to somebody's house, if they invite you over, it's always appropriate to bring something. How many of you think that's good manners? If someone invites you for dinner, you're not supposed to necessarily bring the dinner, but you might bring some flowers, you might bring a little gift, a little uh, nicety, something just to show appreciation. It can weld relationships. The Bible tells about the Queen of Sheba who wanted to see King Solomon. She brought plenty of gifts. Proverbs 18 verse 16, a man's gifts make room for him and bring him before great men. Queen of Sheba wanted to see Solomon, a great man. Here's what it says, 1 Kings 10 verse 1, and when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she's interested in the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very great train, a retinue, with camels that bore spices, his whole caravan. 
and very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all of her questions. There was nothing hid from the king which he told her not. Here's another picture in the Old Testament of a Gentile queen coming to a Jewish king bringing gifts to worship him. And why? Why is she giving them gifts? Is she bribing him for political favors? No, she wants an audience with him because she hears about his wisdom. She has questions about God. She's asking about God. You know, the Bible tells about these ambassadors from Babylon that came and brought gifts to Hezekiah. They wanted to know about God who could make the sun stand still and even go backwards. And instead of telling them about God, Hezekiah gave them a tour of all his stuff. And that backfired. Babylon later came and took all the stuff that Hezekiah had bragged about. Interesting thing in the story of the Queen of Sheba, she brought a gift not to pay for answering questions. Many people miss this passage. She left with more than she brought. She left with more than she brought. Second Chronicles 9.12 Now King Solomon gave to the Queen of Sheba all that she desired. Not only did he ask her questions about life and the purpose of life, whatever she asked, much more than she had brought to the king. I mean, I don't think she went through the kingdom saying, I want this and I want that, but evidently there were things she asked about, and he heaped her with gifts, and her camels went down loaded more than they came with. She did not expect it. But you know, I think that's the way it works with God. Who does Solomon represent? Solomon, the son of David. Solomon means the uh, son of peace. He's a type of Jesus, the son of David. And here, the queen of Sheba, symbol for the church, she comes bringing her gifts, expecting nothing, but she leaves with more than she gave. Isn't that how it works with Jesus? Can you outgive God? No. She left with more than she brought. Gifts can open doors. Gifts are sometimes wasted, especially when we're just giving reciprocal gifts because we feel like we have an obligation. I've got a friend who has a strange theory. He says, if I knew the day and the hour of Jesus coming, he said, I've got a plan, Doug. I get invitations to sign up for new credit cards all the time. Any of you get those? He said, I would sign up for as many credit cards as I could get. I'd withdraw as much money as I could withdraw. I'd give it all to the church, and then when Jesus came, they can't collect. <laughs> that was his plan. I said, I don't, think that's, I don't think I can support that. I don't think that's the way to get the offerings in the church. Have you ever given a gift that you felt was wasted? You know, I, I thought about whether or not to say this. I think it's safe. Karen and I went to a relative's wedding a few weeks ago. This was the wedding to end all weddings. When you go to a wedding, what are you supposed to bring? A gift. And you should do it out of love. And I think it's interesting. They register to tell you where to get their gift. I always resented that it's places like, you know, Saks or... Nordstrom's, I think that what they ought to do is they ought to register the men at Home Depot. And if, why is it just, you've got to get towels and candlesticks and stuff like that. Anyway, but uh, we went to this wedding that was a really nice wedding. It was at the Four Seasons. Did I already tell you about this? It was at the Four Seasons Hotel. That's where Clinton stayed when he's in L.A. Beverly Hills, Four Seasons Hotel. They had the penthouse suite for the honeymoon. They had orchards of roses. I'm not exaggerating. These trees, solid roses that had been built. Beautiful. I think they spent probably $150,000 on this wedding for four hours. I'm not exaggerating. Six days afterward they decided they couldn't get along and parted ways. Six days after that wedding. It's easier to put on, a, you could have bought a house for what the wedding cost. It's easier to put on a good wedding and to give a wedding gift than to have a good marriage, huh? What a waste. You know, I'm not just thinking about the gift. Her mother told her, she says, you've got to send all those gifts back. There's mountains of them. But I think about all the people that flew and drove from all over the country to come to this event. And, they, you know, and then the poor parents, oh, they're devastated. They're absolutely devastated. And you think about what a waste. All the work, work for a year to prepare for that. To give as a gift to their children and have them decide, no, nah, we changed our minds. We don't get along. The Bible says a gift can not only be good, it can be bad. Gifts can blind people's eyes. 
Deuteronomy 16, you'll also find a parallel passage in Exodus. You shall not rest judgment, you'll not respect persons. Here the judges are being charged to be honest. Neither take a gift, for a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and perverts the words of the righteous. Why do you think the tobacco companies make such generous donations to the political parties? It's because they believe in big government? You tell me why. Do they expect anything in return? Yeah, they expect to blind the eyes of those in power to the dangers of tobacco. And it's not just the tobacco companies. Almost every special interest makes political donations because they want to have influence with those in power and they may do something shady someday and they want to blind the eyes of those in power. Well, you know, they give me gifts so I can't really come down too hard on them. Some pastors have had their eyes blinded because they've received gifts from people in the congregation. And... Uh, I'm not saying it's inappropriate to give the pastor a gift. Let's make that clear right now. <laughs> I got an email this morning from, uh, I can tell you this, Angie Lomacane, you know John Lomacane's wife. She said, oh, John's going to be so excited. John and I have been talking because I bought a new handheld computer and he's been wanting to get one of these compact handheld computers. The church is presenting one to him this morning. She's so excited to do that. That wasn't a hint. I already have one. There are things I don't have. You can talk to my wife. But there are congregations where the people have made generous gifts to the pastor and those people sometimes their lives are not where they ought to be and the pastor says, well, you know, they've been awful nice to me. I better not say anything. And their eyes are blinded because of that. That's why I'm glad our church operates on the policy where the tithe goes to the storehouse. It doesn't come to the pastor's bank account. I can be faithful because you don't pay my salary directly to preach the truth. Gifts can blind the eyes. Some gifts should be refused. How many of you remember this incident in the news where after the World Trade Center came down and they were doing the cleanup, some sheik came, I don't remember who it was, but some wealthy sheik came and he went to Mayor Giuliani and he gave, how much was it? $10 million check? And in his statement of delivering the gift, he made some political statement about America being too supportive of the Jews and not supportive enough of the Palestinians and he had a motive in there. And you know what Giuliani said? keep your gift except boy that'd be hard to say no to 10 million dollars I think that takes integrity we'd elect him to president huh we got a good president now don't misunderstand <laughs> I just but finding people that refuse gifts like that in high places that's pretty rare and he said keep your gift if your gift is supposed to mean we endorse your position then we won't when you accept a gift from somebody sometimes it means that you stand with them it means that you're sealing a relationship. You remember the story of Naaman, the Syrian general who had leprosy. And when it was discovered that he had leprosy, of course, he was devastated. He knew he was dying. Elisha the prophet told him to wash in the Jordan River seven times. He would be clean, which he did. He came up out of the water rejoicing, praising God that he was whole. And he decided to go back and give a gift to Elisha for his cleansing. He was so thankful did Elisha accept the gift? No, you know, it's one of the strange passages in the Bible. He was very clear. 2 Kings 5, verse 15 and 16, Naaman said, Please take a gift from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I'll receive nothing. He urged him, and incidentally, this gift was worth millions. And he refused. Why is it this poor prophet refused to take an offering from someone who had been cleansed? Because this cleansing from leprosy was a symbol of cleansing from sin and you cannot attach a price to that. When you accept a gift from somebody and you've just done something for them, it may look like payment. Sometimes it's important not to accept a gift if you've just done something for someone because it will look like they paid for it. You remember when Abraham delivered, Abraham liberated the people of Sodom and Gomorrah when he rescued Lot. And the king of Sodom came to Abraham. He said, here, I want to give you something. You keep all the booty of the war. Abraham said, no, I've lifted my hand to the Lord. I'm not taking anything. Because if I take it, you'll say you made Abraham rich. And if God blesses me, I want him to get the glory, not Sodom. And so sometimes it's appropriate to refuse a gift. Now, you don't want to just be insulting to people. Because when someone gives a gift, to refuse a gift, that can cause a break in relationships, right? 
you spurn a gift that someone has sacrificed for and it can be really painful you know I think one of the things that is going to offend the Lord the most have you ever read about the wrath of the Lamb when Jesus comes what is it that makes the wicked run in terror from a lamb because God so loved the world he gave his son to die that they might be forgiven and they spurned the gift they refused the gift that's the wrong time to refuse a gift but what is the greatest gift well you've got of course gifts of the spirit the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 11 verse 13 if you being evil then know how to give good gifts unto your children how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask probably the greatest gift that we could ask for aside from salvation itself would be the Holy Spirit God in you and when the Holy Spirit comes in you he brings gifts when you're baptized you're married to the Lord and the Lord gives you a wedding gift when you are baptized this is not something I'm speculating you can read about it Acts chapter 2 Peter said repent and be baptized every one of you for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit did he say you might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit you shall receive the gift and if you've been baptized and you've not received any gifts of the Spirit maybe you haven't claimed that promise yet it's just waiting there for you gifts of the Spirit are forgiving they're for sharing Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8 wherefore he said when he ascended on high he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men when Jesus ascended to heaven why did he say it I'm going that I might send a comfort to the Holy Spirit and he gave gifts unto men 1 Corinthians 12 1 now concerning spiritual gifts brethren I would not have you be ignorant God wants us to understand this some of you have gifts that you know about but you're not using it's like this uh, pastor went to visit a lady in the congregation she opened up a drawer she pulled out this beautiful quilt that had been given her 15 years earlier by the church family she says isn't this lovely and it was a beautiful exquisitely handmade quilt and he says, what are you doing keeping it in the drawer she says oh no it's too nice to put on anything so she kept this drawer this uh, quilt cooped up in a drawer some of us have gifts that we're not incorporating in God's service that's another wasted gift so to speak the gifts of the Spirit are something like apple trees apple trees are made to produce apples to give away apple trees do not eat apples apple trees make apples to give away and God gives you gifts to use in blessing and giving to others gifts of healing when you think about the greatest gift those who have been sick would think healing and health would be the greatest thing how many would say amen to that especially the older we get the more we treasure and realize what a gift health really is now if you could choose between having millions of dollars and wretched health or no money and good health what would you ask for how many of you remember the story in the Bible where Peter and John came to this beggar Acts chapter 3 verse 6 at the beautiful gate and they paused and they looked at him and he thought he was going to get something from him from them he was expecting a handout he was expecting a few coins and Peter realizing that he misunderstood their intentions he said silver and gold we do not have but what I do have I give you and he told this crippled man in the name of Jesus rise up and walk didn't give him a penny but you know what the Bible says he followed Peter and John into the temple leaping and jumping and praising God do you think he was happy about his gift oh man he was exuberant had no money but he's praising God because he got his health back health is a great gift and God has given you health and it's a gift that uh, he can restore according to this story when you think about the greatest gifts have you ever thought Lord please give me the gift of service that's typically not what we pray we say Lord give me servants give me more servants I want more to serve me that's a sign of success in the world but God says service is a gift Jesus said I'm the greatest and I came as one to serve there's an example of this in the Bible numbers chapter 8 verse 19 the Lord said to the children of Levi I have given the Levites as a gift God says I've given it as a gift to Aaron and to his sons from among the children of Israel to do service for the children of Israel in the tabernacle of the congregation 
All of the other children of Israel, when they crossed over the Jordan, they received as a gift from God different sections of the promised land as a possession. But the children of Israel did not get any territory. They did not get any real estate per se because they'd been given a gift of service. How many of you would think that you were cheated? It almost seems like the Levites were left out. But you know, God says, no, I'm not leaving them out. I'm blessing them. I'm giving them a bigger gift. The others get some territory. They get some dirt. But you get service. I'm choosing you to serve me. You know, the real Christian attitude is to view that as a great gift. To be called by God to serve. I have my moments, believe me, when pastoring becomes a challenge. The pressures of amazing facts and everything I do. And if you have days like that, I mean, you know, you know I'm not... It's not that bad, but I have my days. But you know, then I think about it, I think, Doug, you have been given a great gift to serve. That's a gift that not everybody gets. It's a responsibility, but it's a, it's a gift. Have you asked God to give you the gift to serve more people better? It's a, one of the greatest gifts, a gift of service. Gifts of reception. Now here's something that may get a little bit tangled, but it's a gift to receive a gift. Some people don't know how to accept a gift. That's a gift in and of itself. Psalms 11, I'm sorry, Psalms 116 verse 12 and 13. What shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits for me? What do I give God for all of his gifts for me? You don't give him anything. You don't give God anything because of what he's given you. Here's what you do. I will take the cup of salvation. One of the ways we respond to the gifts is to receive. Some people don't know how to just accept a compliment. Some people don't know how to accept a gift. And it's a gift to know how to receive a gift. You remember the story of the boy who... Um, Andrew found this boy and, and he didn't have enough to feed everybody but he had five loaves and a couple of fish. And Jesus took this gift, he received this gift from a boy. And the apostles received this gift from a boy. It, it's a, um, a privilege to be able to accept or to receive something like that. Family is a gift. You know, the Bible says more in particular, children are the heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Happy is the man that has his quiver full. In our day and age, not too many people want to brag about full quivers. It's politically incorrect to say you've got 12 kids. People think you're irresponsible, not blessed, right? But biblically, family is called a blessing. You remember the story of the Shunammite woman who, uh, she did these nice things for Elisha the prophet and Elisha said to Gehazi his servant, I want to do something to show appreciation. Now it is appropriate to give a gift for something to show appreciation and it's, you're still not paying for what they've done. There's a... Um, a man who is a member of our denomination but he's a member of another church who gave a great deal of free assistance to our board last year and when we offered to give him something for his services he said no I refused so instead we bought him a gift because that shows appreciation without payment you see what I'm saying here so this woman she wanted to do something she built this room on top of her roof for Elisha and she was so nice and put a candle and a bed and a stool and Elisha says she's been so good I'd like to give her something what can I give her now you know this is a prophet you think big and Gehazi said well you know their house has not been graced with children yet he said that's what it is I'll talk to the Lord and God is gonna bless them with a child. You know, when a man and a woman get married, you call them husband and wife, but you can call them a family, but it doesn't seem like family sometimes, even though technically they are a family, until they got little people running around. And I know that's tough for some folks that may not have that, but let's face it, that's true. And when he graced this home with a baby, it was a great gift. Family is a gift, not just children. But uh, some people are alone, especially during the holidays. They have a hard time. You know, one of the greatest gifts is the gift of time. Time is the stuff life is made of and it's very precious. You think about all the time those wise men invested in coming to give gifts. Not only did they study the scriptures and cross a desert, but then they gave a gift on top of all that. 
Part of the gift was not just the frankincense and the myrrh, it was the time invested in coming all that way. Time is a gift. Every Sabbath, God has given us a gift. This sacred period of time is a gift from God to us, and when we set it aside for holy time with God, it's our return to Him. Some gifts, their real value is not recognized. Now, I just need to admit something to you. Don't try to change my mind. I don't think you'll be able to. But I cannot understand when you walk through one of these expensive department stores and they spray this musk on you and you say well that smells nice how much is that fifty dollars a hundred dollars and there's a teaspoon in a bottle that to me is overvalued I think that's anyone else any men agree with me on that fifty dollars for a little spritz of smell in a bottle and you think is it really worth that much what does God count as the greatest gifts? I think the way we value things in this world is so distorted. You remember when Jesus was sitting in the temple and he looked up and he saw the rich man coming, coming by the offering box and they were casting their bags of gold in the offering box and Jesus made no comment. Then he saw a certain poor widow coming in and she cast in two mites. And suddenly Jesus blurted out, Of a truth I say to you that this poor widow has cast in more than all of them. For all of these have cast in of their abundance. But she of her poverty has cast in all the living that she had. She gave everything. What was the most valuable thing to the Lord? Was it the gift or was it the, the adoration in the gift? Was it the amount or the amount of sacrifice? When we give our gifts to God, do we tip Him? Or do we make a sacrifice that's proportionate of what He has done for us? That's expressive of how much He's blessed us. You keep reading in this same passage. And it says, as they left the temple, some of the apostles pointed to the stones and the beautiful adoration and the gold on the walls and how it was adorned and its gifts. And Jesus said, as for these things, behold, the days come, there will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. We spend our resources embellishing and elaborating our houses and it will all be burnt someday. Isn't that right? We get our values mixed up. That which really matters, that which is really going to last are people whose lives are transformed for eternity. And finally, what's the greatest gift? The gift of salvation. That God so loved the world He would give His Son. That He would free us when we're slaves. That when we're dead He'd give us liberty. When we're in darkness, He gives us light. The gift of salvation. God giving His own Son. Coming into the world, becoming one of us. Have you ever considered that the best gifts are when the giver puts himself in the gift? Sometimes I think it means more to a wife or to a parent when rather than handing money to somebody, you take time and you make something. This year for the family, Karen spent a lot of time going through all our pictures and she went and cut through all the pictures and she went through to Kinko's and she made these placemats that are com collages, a composite of the different families and sent them out and we've already got word back how much they appreciate this. I'm sure you probably, if you talk about the material value, they're probably three, four dollars a piece after you pay for Kinko's. A lot of time went into it. A person puts themselves in a gift and it means much more. It's like that little three-year-old girl who was playing around the tree a few days before Christmas and started messing with the presents. And she's shaking them, trying to figure out what's inside. And she shook a bow, you know, these little stick-on bows. She shook a bow off one, and she took the bow and got creative. In a moment of inspiration, she stuck it on her head, and she said, Look, Daddy, I'm a gift. <laughs> and how true it is. When somebody is in the gift, that's when it becomes the greatest gift when you are in the gift that you give that's when it's the most precious you know the Bible tells us Jesus is in his gift Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 for by grace you are saved through faith that not of yourselves it's a gift of God not of works we can't pay for it lest any man should boast have the people I'm sorry in 2nd Corinthians 9 15 it says thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift the gift of salvation that God has given us is so precious. You know, we thought it would be appropriate today to do something different. 
Typically, we collect the offerings. Today, I'd like to have you turn to our closing hymn. That's 141 in our hymnals, What Child Is This? And we'd like to ask you if you could do something a little different. We're going to ask you to bring your tithes and your offerings this morning. And because we're doing it this way, you know, it, it gives us the understanding that it's not being collected, but we are giving ourselves when we bring the gifts. Let's stand together. We're going to sing this together as the, um, the organ plays 141. And I'd invite the congregation uh, during one of the verses to come forward. You may want to send it with one member of the family or the child and to bring your gifts before the Lord. We think once a year we make a special gift of sacrifice and uh, today is the day we want to do this. God so loved the world he gave. Let's do the same. I think it's important for us to remember this time of year when we're giving gifts to everyone else. Ask God to help us guard ourselves. You don't want to go into debt trying to reciprocate with everybody and forget about the one who so loved the world he gave his son. Amen? We want to ask God to help us to have the, the prudence and the judgment and the sobriety to really keep our priorities straight. I believe it's wonderful to take time and express to others your appreciation, your love, but well, let's be careful that we don't forget the one, they say, the, uh, who is the reason for the season. And that we don't neglect the Lord at this time when we're thinking about maintaining our relationships with each other. 
if some perhaps did not come prepared or have, were not uh, ready or did not want to come forward, we will have some deacons that will be at the main entrances with a plate if um, you would like to give your gift or your check at that time in that way. Let's bow our heads together. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the greatest gift. You so loved the world that you gave your son. And Lord, I pray that we'll always keep this before us, that Jesus himself was in that gift. Lord, I pray that we can give ourselves a gift, that we can present ourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is our reasonable service. Amazing Facts Ministry has been broadcasting the gospel since 1966 when it aired its first radio program in Baltimore, Maryland. Elder Joe Cruz was the speaker director for more than 30 years. At that time, no one dreamed that Amazing Facts would become a multifaceted worldwide ministry. The heartbeat of the gospel pulsating from this ministry is heard today on radio, television, the internet, the Correspondence Bible School, the publishing ministry, and local and worldwide evangelism. Pastor Doug Batchelor stepped into the leadership of the ministry after Joe Cruz died in 1994. Currently, Amazing Facts is on more than 100 TV stations and 11 satellite and cable networks throughout the United States, Europe, Australia, Central and South America, the Middle East, and Asia. For more information, call 1-800-835-6906. The Bible gives us the promise of a glorious life for all who are saved. Imagine if you can, walking on streets of gold, a sea as smooth as glass, and the choicest fruit from the tree of life. How can man, full of sin and imperfection, achieve the dream of eternal life? What must we do to be saved? These questions are answered in this free booklet titled, Three Steps to Heaven. This encouraging, easy-to-read booklet outlines God's plan for you to reach the heavenly hope prepared for all mankind. This booklet, Three Steps to Heaven, is yours free. You'll be excited to learn about God's plan for you. There's no cost or obligation, so call now, 1-800-835-6906. Be sure to ask for offer number 102 when you call. Or write to us at Amazing Facts, Post Office Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. Be prepared for life. The Amazing Facts Catalog provides quality Christian resources for people seeking a closer walk with God and those wanting to share their faith. With over 300 new items to choose from, you're sure to find plenty of spiritual food for the soul. To order your free catalog, call 1-800-538-7275 or write to Amazing Facts, Post Office Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. The number to call again, 1-800-538-7275.